Well, I've already said a little bit about um, who I am, where I'm, uh, why I'm here <laughs> and not somebody else. Um, and thank you, all of you, for being here this evening. This is, um, I think it's a topic that's really important for us to be thinking about uh, these days because there's a lot of uh, political tension, I suppose you could say, around some of the issues related to culture, uh, multiculturalism, whatever that word might mean, uh, but also more like cultural conflict at times and um, shading into issues around ethnicity and race as well. So um, it's hard, I think, oftentimes for us to figure out how exactly to talk about these things from a perspective of the faith, from a Christian and Catholic perspective, right? That um, isn't always clearly, it's hard to see it in some of the political narratives. Um, perhaps on all sides, actually, I think, too. I'll, I don't think this is a partisan statement. <laughs> um, so I try to be careful when I approach these issues to try to pay attention to my own sort of inner states too, because it comes up against things that are adjacent to broader political issues that can be emotional at times for myself as well, right? Um, and just to try to sit back and like think about that in itself as well as part of, as part of this, this situation. And I would encourage all of us to be thinking about that as well uh, this evening. Um, I've articulated it here on the title slide as a presentation on faith and culture. Um, and I think that's appropriate uh, for uh, the church as a whole, just to understand like that cultures, well, even like in the Second Vatican Council, for instance, cultures are described in a couple different ways. On the one time, on the one hand, the Second Vatican Council says that cultures are singular. There's actually only one human culture that all human beings share in a single culture that builds up the things that promote human flourishing. But on the other hand, the, the council also recognizes that cultures are individual and that there's something to be said of a, a distinction and a diversity of cultures as well. Things that make a particular people what they are uh, in a place and a time. Uh, and so I'm going to just say a little bit about like what we mean by culture, what we mean by faith here. Um, on the one hand, we got to say, well, the, the faith is one, right? There's one faith that makes everybody Roman Catholic. Well, Catholic, at least. I'm going to say a little bit more about the Roman part in a second. Um, well, we got to say, certainly, right? This, this is a quote from Ephesians. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. Those things hold us together. Uh, for us as Catholics, right, the ecumenical councils are one of the things that we hold together in common. Uh, the Petrine office, or what we call the Pope, right, um, is another important aspect of being Catholic. <laughs> uh, but also, I would say, the saints themselves are an important piece of what hold us together. Because their holiness is an example for us that points us toward our final destiny together as one. So we talk about the church triumphant, which would this, be a, uh, this would be an image of here in this slide, uh, saying that there is something that will bring us all together at the end. Um, and of course, the object of our worship, the triune God, um, who is one. And so guarantees, like in John chapter 17, Jesus says, he prays to, to the Father saying, May they be one as we are one, as the Father and, and Jesus are one. And so there's a union that comes from that as well. But on the other hand, these same things that I just said in many cases can also be expressed in terms of a certain sort of diversity. So if on the one hand, um, we could say like from the very beginning of Christianity, it was a combination of Jews who had one religious and cultural heritage and Greeks who had a different one. So this is, uh, I believe it's an image of Paul preaching in Athens, one of the sort of central places of Greek philosophy. Um, 
So there's a cultural diversity from the very beginning. There's a linguistic diversity from very early on. Um, so we see here, like uh, maybe you can see the slide. It's not very easy maybe, but Greek and Latin and Coptic and Aramaic and Syriac are all different parts of the linguistic diversity of the early Christian communities. Hi, sorry. <laughs> Everybody else said their names. Do you mind just... Sorry, you're fine. Yeah. Dead? Great. Great. Glad you're here. Um, but then we also have, right, the witness of the saints themselves and the different kinds of lives that they lived. That's a certain sort of diversity, even though it's lived in the unity of the faith. Uh, in these three images, these are three different Roman uh, Catholic rites. I keep saying Roman. I don't mean that there. Uh, I'll tell you, say you a little bit more of what a rite is in the next slide. But these are different uh, ways of worshiping within uh, Catholicism in different parts of the world. And these might not look familiar to us, right? This one's an Indian uh, Ciro Malabar church. And there's no pews, right? I mean, there, you've got Jesus there in the center still, right? But it looks different than what we're used to. And certainly people are dressed differently there than we might be used to here. Um, and so this is a certain sort of diversity of what I would say is our, the worship practices even within the church. And uh, that's with, throughout history and in different parts of the world. So uh, I'll, this next slide here is a map of all those different cultural rites, right? They, they arise out of different linguistic and cultural contexts that Christians had in the earliest centuries. And it's often simply because they were so closely, that they encountered Christianity so early in Christianity's own existence <laughs> that they got these privileged kinds of uh, liturgical celebrations. So most of us are probably over here in the Western or Latin Catholic rite. Um, and this, by and large, right, is, is there an extraordinary form mass at this parish ever? Do you know? Well, there's an ordin this, then most of us here would be familiar with what's called the ordinary form of the mass. Um, but then there's also an extraordinary form, which has two different forms, a high and a low. And then there's a recent introduction of another version called the Anglican use of it. And uh, we don't need to go into that. <laughs> But the point is that this is going to get big here, right? Then there's religious orders that each have their own uh, liturgical rites within the Latin church. And these are also what are called Gallican rites. Uh, those are different. And those are like different forms of the mass, right? Of the liturgy. And some of them don't even call it the mass. They call it the liturgy. <laughs> uh, divine liturgy. And divine liturgy would be the preferred term in most of these over here. So these are uh, not, I mean, they are under the jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff, but these are groups that have their own canon law and their liturgies are celebrated according to the rules of their own traditions in those groups. They're called sui iuris then, that they're sort of self-governed in that way. And there's a lot of these too. I don't, I'm not even going to try to tell you anything about all of them, but you get the idea, right? That all of these are, and many of those pictures that I just showed you were from some of these different versions of the, the liturgy that, uh, that all count as Catholic. <laughs> I have a friend who's a Ruthenian, and I put it down there in the lower corner. And sometimes I like to joke with him about whether he's really Catholic, because like, I put our forms way over here on the other side. It's friendly, though, right? Like, we, no, we are all Catholic, even though their liturgy and the liturgy that I'm used to look quite different at times. And I wouldn't, you know, easily recognize what's going on in some of these other uh, liturgies. There's plenty of them that actually exist here in the Twin Cities too, right? Um, if you've ever been to uh, Saint, uh, Church of St. Marin, um, that's a Maronite rite Catholic church. And there's a couple others nearby there, I think, that also have other uh, rites that are celebrated there. Does that make sense then? Is, do you see sort of what I'm gesturing at here at least? Because we are sort of a smaller group, I'm not, I don't need to keep going, right? You can raise your hands if there's any questions or concerns on anything too. Um, 
So then we come to the fact, though, that when it came to the spread of Christianity, especially during the period that that class that I was just mentioning that I teach, right, the American history class, um, Christianity is spreading in this period largely in conjunction with churches that called themselves Roman Catholics, Latin Catholics, the kind that we're familiar with, right? Um, and there was the obviously great benefit of the spread of the gospel through this experience of expansion of Euro European influence uh, in many different parts of the world. Uh, but at the same time, right, we have to recognize that they generally shared that one particular history of being Latin Catholics, right, that their linguistic and cultural heritage is that of the Roman Latin church. Um, and then, you know, this is a, a Philippine, uh, Filipino celebration uh, that, that's very cultural there, right? It's, it's part of their uh, life in the Philippines, but it's still expressed within the Latin rite of the Catholic Church, even though the cultures of those places were originally right, quite different, perhaps, in some ways. And so the fact is that these other cultures that were encountered uh, through this period of interaction with Europeans and non-Europeans uh, did not lead to new rites to be introduced in the church, right? Like, it's not like we have a new liturgy that has to do, like a, a, a Sioux liturgy for, the, I'm from South Dakota, right? So the Lakota Sioux, right? They don't get their own rite of the church, right? There's not like a, a, a rite associated with each of these different cultures. So the question that comes to my mind next then is, well, how do we recognize those cultural heritages if they don't have like a distinct liturgical place in the church? What is their place for us today? How do we honor and respect them? Well, uh, I propose for us this evening that a major way of doing so is to simply try to tell the stories of those saints as honestly as we can. So uh, I'm not even going to say anything about the saints here yet, but these are the eight that are right behind you here. Um, and I'll say a little bit about the collection as a whole. We started with them over at Nativity of Mary Parish. And the idea was to combine our parish devotion to Mary. So each of these eight saints, when I did my research on them, I looked for saints that had some sort of devotion to Mary. And so there's a symbol in all but one of them. We couldn't figure out a way to integrate a, a Marian symbol into one of them that points to Mary, right, as a part of their own devotion as, uh, as a Catholic. Uh, but beyond that, we also wanted to make sure that we recognize that it's our job to try to imitate these saints in their own are places. These, are these paintings? Yeah, well, the, it's digital art. So that's Aaron Wee is our artist. And so... They're easy to reproduce, and we're working on getting prints for people to take home, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and so it was easy enough for us to make a second copy for, for this kind of event. But the, some of these saints then are modeled after congregants in our parish, right? And the goal there was to help us recognize that we strive to be like them, right? And so it's mainly the ones that are from the pre-modern period that are modeled on congregants. But <laughs> there's no pictures of them, in other words, so we kind of felt like we had the artistic license. <laughs> um, and they also include uh, other aspects of their ministries. For instance, um, I'll say in a moment, Henriette, for instance, down here has a pencil in her hand. She was an educator, among other things. So those are uh, important for some of the cultural issues that they encountered in their own lives. So what I want to do next then is to actually try to do some of that work and tell some of these stories in a short form. Um, maybe a couple of minutes is what I'm hoping on each of these uh, eight figures uh, to say a little bit about what their life was like um, and what kinds of experiences of cultural conflict they, ex they, they experienced in their lives. Um, 
that's one of the things that holds these together too, is that they had conflicts in their, in their existence. So St. Teresa, right? Um, I, we, we spell it differently, in, right? It used to be Calcutta, right? It's, I, I tried to use the new one here. I think it's called Kata now, right, or something. But um, she was originally from Macedonia, North Macedonia. I think her ethnic group is a little bit different than that. It's modern day North Macedonia. She studied in England and eventually uh, moved to, with her religious order, once she, we, we all know that she became religious, right? Um, to India, where they had a ministry. And obviously, the map here, you could see uh, India is predominantly Hindu in most parts. There are portions there where Islam up in the north is the predominant religion. Um, and then, you know, small little uh, areas now uh, to the east there that where Christianity is the single largest religious group. But it's a, you know, it's a very religiously diverse country too in that way. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, well, you know, once she's founded her own religious order, she has this call from Christ in, I think, 1940. Does anybody remember? Uh, 1940. I don't want to get it wrong. Seven, maybe, though. It says on my handout there, too. Does it say? Six. 46. 46. Okay, I was off by a year. All right. So 1946, she has this vision of Christ in which she um, decides that she needs to be serving the poorest of the poor in India. And she was from a religious order that was doing education before, but now she's going out into the slums, into one of the most, one of the more challenging aspects of Indian culture, which is the caste system, right? So oftentimes an individual then would have often been just assigned to one of these castes. And that sort of determined a lot of what was possible for individuals in Indian society at that time. And in order to heal some of these divisions that arose because of the caste system, she devotes herself to the Dalits, right? those who are on the outskirts, the people who are at the almost outside of the caste system. They don't even get their own rung <laughs> in the system. And so her service is really right to the, it, to the poorest of the poor. Um, and some of you may have heard of her experience of the dark night of the soul. Um, this idea that she had this sort of spiritual desolation throughout mu much of her life. Uh, some of her biographers have understood that as a union both with Christ, but through Christ with the poor as well, who experienced different forms of desolation in their own um, spiritual journeys because of their material uh, opportunities. Uh, moving on, St. Pedro, Colungsod. He's a far East Asian saint uh, from the Philippines, the central Philippines. Um, he, at a very young age, I think as young as 14 or so, he decided that he wanted to mission with the Jesuits who had, uh, who had introduced Christianity to him. He accepted baptism from them, at a, 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 I think after the age of reason, right? A relatively, you know, like an infant baptism, I think. Um, and he decided that he was going to become a lay catechist, meaning that he's going to use his own position as a member of these cultures in that area to try to help spread what he came to view as most valuable, the faith, right? To other islands and to other perhaps subcultures, you might call them on different islands. So he ends up missioning all the way out there uh, at the red dot, which is Guam, right? That's a, an American territory today. And it was on that island where there was a misunderstanding, let's say, <laughs> between one of the leaders there who thought that the baptisms that the Jesuits were performing there were killing children uh, and the missionaries then. Um, and so because of that misunderstanding, Pedro and at least one other of the Jesuits that were uh, missioning in that area were martyred by 
uh, that particular group. Um, and so in the image, you'll see the machete as one of the images of uh, one of the... Uh, when? Uh, 1630s? What? I, I have my... Sl oh, I don't have the right piece of paper here. But the, the fuller... Um, and I'm, I'm going to have us... I'm not going through everything on this sheet because I want us to be able to spend some time later on. You can focus on the ones that are of more interest to you as well. Uh, this is personally one of my own favorites here. This is, his name is Blessed Christian de Cherge. He's a late 20th century saint. So one of the most recent in the, I think he is the most recent in the collection. Uh, he was martyred in uh, 1996 in northern Algeria. But he, uh, at a younger age, he served in the French military during the Algerian Civil War. This was right at the end of the colonial period where France was withdrawing from northern Africa. And the, there was a, a, a violent attempt to drive the French out of that country by the original, you know, Muslim, largely, <laughs> population of Algeria. Um, so he was in the military during that conflict. And a Muslim man, at one point during that experience, saved his life. And then died the next day. So this was like a turning point in his life where someone from a different faith had saved his life and then probably because of what he had done to save him was himself killed. <laughs> so, right, it shows divisions within Islam for sure, but it, it shows other kinds, there's all kinds of conflict there, right? Um, and he de decides that he wants to return to Algeria once he uh, finishes his schooling and uh, he's a, he becomes a Trappist monk in the city of Tiberin, Algeria. And he has a religious community in the 80s and 90s um, of, well, at the end, it was nine members of that community. And then war broke out again in Algeria in the 1990s, 1994, I believe. And... Despite that conflict, his religious community decided we are here to serve the Muslim population of northern Algeria. And even though French people in the country are not welcome right now, we're going to stay and continue to serve that community. And in 1996, um, a group of Islamic extremists broke into their monastery and kidnapped seven of them. And they were uh, about three months later martyred. Two of them escaped and, only, and one of them only died a couple years, a few years ago now. So it's very recent. <laughs> and it, this is the one example of an individual who cuts across. Um, not, it's not just, well, it's, there's indigenous religions as well, of course, but this is the only other like major world religion example from the collection of cultural conflict, let's say. Um, and on the image, one, one, I, I'll try to point to something from each of the images. On his hand here, you can see uh, this, uh, it's an Arabic word, and it, I mean, it's the Arabic word Allah uh, for his service to the Muslim community in northern Algeria. And I would I just want to point out too that in Muslim in Arabic speaking countries uh, throughout Africa, uh, the word Allah is used both by Muslims and by Christians as the word for God. And so um, some of the divisions that sometimes we sort of use around that word in America might not make sense in some of those parts of the world too. Um, Saint Kateri. Tekakwitha, from upstate New York. She was Mohawk. Uh, her family died of smallpox when she was four years old, her immediate family, so both her parents. Um, and I don't even recall if she had any siblings, I'm afraid, right now, sorry. Um, you know, it, this was often accidental, but there are instances of it being spread intentionally that we have in the historical record. Um, she was accepted baptism at the age of 20, though, uh, at the hands of, I believe, Jesuit missionaries. 
Um, and this, in turn, led her to be rejected by other members of her tribe, her uncle in particular, who was the, uh, mo the, the, the chief of that community. And she moved to a Christian-founded town north of that red dot in modern-day Canada, where there were still divisions between Christians and indigenous populations there as well. So even when she moved with the Christians, right, it wasn't just like a walk in the park necessarily for her. She engaged in various forms of self-mortification, probably as a way to try to express her sorrow <laughs> uh, over the divisions between her and her tribe and between her and other parts of the, com the, the community that they were living in. She died at the age of 24. Uh, what did she die of? What did I write it down here? Um, I don't recall off the top of my head if I wrote it down or not. No, I, yeah, I, I don't, I didn't write it down. I can't recall off the top of my head either. Sorry. We could probably look it up. There's always more work to do. Um, Juan Diego, right? There's another one that's pretty well known these days. Um, modern day Mexico City is where he was from. Tenochtitlan is the town. Um, and he received visions of the Virgin Mary. Um, but she appeared to him in a way that would be familiar to him as well. So with some indigenous features, with indigenous clothing, and even with some indigenous religious symbols that would have been meaningful uh, in the re religious life of, the pre-Christian religious life that is, of the, the, the people, the Chichimeca people is I believe his tribe, among others then too. Um, and the idea of, of Mary wearing the clothing of the people, right, is an interesting idea um, because uh, you may have seen some of these images. So these are, you know, I, I, make, of them what, make of them what you will. But at times, right, Europeans in their interactions with native populations tried to get them to change their clothes, right, and to cut their hair, right, and so things like this, right, where they would, and this is an old time photo, right? They thought this was something to be proud of at the time. They took a picture of them in their indigenous clothes and then cut their hair and did all this stuff and put them in, you know, military almost looking uniforms, right? And then took another picture of them and said, see, look, now we've, we've civilized them, perhaps even, they might say, right? And there's other examples of it like this. So for Mary to appear in indigenous clothing is run somewhat counter to some of the practices of some of the Europeans, right? You can almost see this as Mary saying something to those people, perhaps, <laughs> that there's values here that may be lost. St. Josephine Bukihita is um, an interesting example of a non, well, she's, she's from Sudan, but she spent most of her life in Italy. Uh, she's from the Darfur region, there in the, the highlighted region there of uh, Eastern Africa. She was uh, sold, I think I got the dates wrong on, my, uh, on this sheet that I handed out, but I, 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 she was kidnapped at the age of nine and sold into slavery to Turkish Muslims, and then later uh, sold to Italian Christians who brought her back to Italy. And so she was, I believe the, the final dates for her uh, enslavement were around nine to 20 years old. Um, and it, this, she's actually something of a national figure in Italy though, because unlike the civil war here, right? That kind of like resolved the slavery issue here. Um, Italy never had like an official law legalizing slavery. But at the same time, she was being held in Italy at the time as a slave until 1889, right? So quite late compared to like when the Emancipation Proclamation 
was signed here in the, in the United States. Um, and, and one of the odd pieces of that actually is that what the deliberations of the courts in Italy weren't necessarily interested in whether Italy legalized it or not. They were more interested in whether her own country legalized it or not at the time that she was taken as a slave, right? So she could have remained a slave if they had said, well, I guess Sudan just has slaves, so I guess you're a slave still. <laughs> I mean, that's what it seems like the deliberations could have indicated there. Anyway. So, uh, but she was introduced to Christianity by the Canosian sisters of Italy. Um, they gave her a crucifix. And following that uh, introduction, she took it upon herself to fight uh, legally for her emancipation from her Italian slave owners. And it, you know, it, it caused waves in, in Italy. It was, this was like a turning point for the illegalization of slavery in the country. Um, and so she, she, after she was granted her physical freedom, she also then uh, decided to pursue her, her spiritual freedom with the Canosians and uh, stayed with that community for the next 45 years in Italy. Um, she supported the Order's African missions with her prayers and uh, had a, a very devout religious life as well during that time. Henriette Delisle is a, a local-ish one. She's from the United States. She's from uh, New Orleans. Uh, and then because of that, right, she's a part or an outgrowth, so to speak, of the, the French colonial uh, system, I guess you could even call it, I guess. Um, she was a mixed race, and that meant that she had been born from a system that's sometimes described as plassage, where young French men would come to the colonies and take, like, let's say, just like temporary wives <laughs> uh, from mixed race and indigenous populations, black folk too, and um, and then get, they would have children and a family, and then they would return to France and probably oftentimes support them financially after they left. But it was not like a canonically recognized like marriage arrangement from the church either, right? So she was born of one of those relationships. And it seems like she actually may have uh, been selected for one of these relationships at a young age and had two children from it who tragically died by the age of she was, uh, by the time she was 19. Um, she experienced a deepening conversion, though, at the age of 24 and became a critic of this plissage system. Um, and also in a lay group organization, started uh, educating slaves in the 1840s, which was illegal at the time um, in New Orleans. Uh, she was also, though, at the, at, from that point on, she was uh, denied entry into the religious orders of the time in New Orleans because of her racial heritage. So the, the religious orders of the time did not ad admit black or mixed race individuals. Um, and so she ended up starting her own religious order and she did receive approval for it from her, for, from her bishop, I believe. Is that a common practice? Uh, well, this was, she, there were only two uh, religious communities for non white folk in the United States prior to the Civil War, and hers is one of them. So I would say it's not very common, yes. So Catholic religious orders were segregated? Uh, well, you, you, there wouldn't even be segregation, because, I mean, until like her kind existed, there wasn't even segregation, because it was just, just yeah, they just weren't allowed. What about in Europe or other? I don't know as much about other parts of the world on this, right? Yeah. St. Martin before I was had a St. Martin. She, he does, and he's next. Like he yeah, and that was very early in the, but the, you know, it's an American experience, even if it's not a North American experience. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, but she did start this mixed race, uh, or religious order for mixed race women. Uh, she didn't overcome all the obstacles of her place and time. It was only for mixed race, and this is very stratified. Right, so she was mixed race, and then she was only allowed to 
have mixed race people in her order, right? So black folk were not admitted till later, like pure black, I guess you'd say, right? Um, and she died of, I believe, tuberculosis the year before the Emancipation Proclamation, 1862. Uh, her story, among some of these others and others not in this collection, is told in this volume, uh, which is it's a short little book, actually, but it's got some good stuff, um, some background on all these uh, various saints. Uh, finally, Martin de Porres, right? Uh, maybe not finally, but <laughs> he's close here. Um, he's from Lima, Peru, right there in sort of South America, right? Uh, he, he had a Spanish father who was a part of the sort of Spanish government of the city. And he also had a black or indigenous woman for his mother. Um, his father abandoned the family shortly after the birth of him and his sister. And uh, he was then, because of both of his illegitimacy and his ethnic heritage, was also uh, denied entry into the religious orders of <coughs> Lima uh, in his time, at least not full membership. He petitioned for a few different orders and was ultimately allowed to become a third order, which is called, a, it's like a lay Dominican, um, lay, third, third order Dominican though. And he served in the kitchen and in the hospital wing where he was uh, attributed with many miracles uh, for the healing of individuals in that portion of their monastery. So that's, that's them, <laughs> okay? I'll try to keep this last part quick. There's not too much left here. Um, I want to emphasize and, and think about this idea, right? Because there's four marks of the church. The church is one, holy, Catholic, apostolic, right? We say that every Sunday at mass. And all the stories, some of the stories I said at least just now, might make it hard to see where that holiness is. Um, especially when we see like religious orders that aren't admitting people based on their ethnicity. Um, so, you know, we have in Italy, I mean, that's where the Pope is, right? She was allowed to be held a slave until 1889. In New Orleans, right, we have uh, Henriette, who was denied entry. And Lima, Peru, this is uh, Martin de Porres' community, his monastery. And in the United States, one other example that's not in the collection is Augustus Tolton, the first openly black candidate for the priesthood in the United States. Um, he had to be sent to Rome to, for seminary because no American seminary would accept him in the 1870s. Um, it's hard to see the holiness of the church <laughs> in some of those examples, right? But um, this is not meant to be a moment of despair, <laughs> quite the opposite. This is why I think the stories of these saints are so important because it is in the saints themselves that we see the holiness of the church. So in each of these instances, the, the real phrase, I, I modified it, it's the blood of the martyrs is the seeds of the church. That's an, an ancient phrase. I'm modifying a little bit, right? But I think the, the sentiment remains this, the same here. Josephine is the holiness of the church in that instance. Henriette is the holiness of the church. Martin is. And Augustus, Tolton, is the church's holiness. And I'd just like to close with just a few reflections on what I think some of the things that they might be considered holy for are. Things that maybe hopefully can be inspirations <laughs> for all of us. They bound up the social wounds of their times, right? They sacrificed themselves in service of the lowest of the lowest, the poorest of the poor. They risked being misunderstood by those around them from other tribes, from other religions. 
they embodied the pains of the divisions in the world that they lived. They offered up their sufferings to try to heal those divisions. They pointed to new cultural life in the church. Our Lady of the Americas, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And in these last three examples in particular, I like to think of these uh, last three as embodying a ministry of presence, which is to say that they could have walked away from the church. And in some sense, I wouldn't have blamed them, right? If they would have just said, well, if you're not going to let me in, like, what am I doing here? But no, they're saying, I am, you're telling me that I'm God's image, right? So let's, let's see that, right? That this is not a merely passive thing for them. Their presence in some ways was the challenge to the church around them. And I think this last phrase is particularly poignant here, right? Because they were, at this one, on, in the one sense, they were the ones who were being evangelized, but their presence was also that by which they helped evangelize those who were evangelizing them to help them understand the gospel better. To say, the church needs us too. So, um, you know, the next piece would be then for you to think about this as well, right? These are just some of my ideas on where we could look for the holiness of these saints. But um, if we're feeling up for it, the next piece would be for you to spend some time thinking about some of these things yourselves. Um, I had planned, depending on how attendance turns out, we can do whatever you want here, uh, for three options though. You can either take these images into the church with you and spend some time in personal prayer with the uh, biographies that I have prepared, as well as uh, some of the questions then that I've written up on the back side for personal reflection at the top of the back of the page. And the second option, if you wanted to spend some time talking about this with other people that you might know or not know here, um, you can, uh, there's some guide, guidance here on the front for ideas about how you might try to talk about the lives of these saints together a little bit. And, you know, I would encourage you also to be looking at the fuller biographies as well in that instance, if you'd like to do that. Um, and then a third option uh, is that I can keep talking too. I have other stuff that um, I can keep, uh, to say, that does a little bit more uh, fuller introduction to the history around Catholicism and slavery uh, and uh, issues of race in the history of the church. Um, and no matter what you're comfortable with and no matter what you choose to do here next, <laughs> uh, I do encourage you to look at some of the other options later on too, because a discussion with other people I think is an important piece of what this whole project is about, right? To, have us, to get us talking with each other about these important and really sensitive issues, right? Um, and, uh, and be sure that you have time for for prayer with and for and to these folks, the saints of our church. And so I, I remind us at the bottom, right? And maybe we should just end with this before questions real quick is maybe for each one of them, you know, the invocation format generally, right? Where we would just say the name of the saint and then pray for us, right? So maybe I'll lead us through that list real quick. So let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Josephine. St. Juan. St. Kateri. St. Martin. St. Pedro. St. Teresa. Blessed Christian. Venerable Henriette. Lord, you give us examples to live our lives by that we might ourselves reflect a ray of the light of Christ. 
strengthen us and give us the resolve to try to imitate these saints in our own lives today. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I've already said.